Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Everybody Eats Show. We got your favorite host here of the greatest show on the East Coast, greatest business show on the East Coast. And we are joined by a really special guest uh, with us today, Mr. Jason Ford from New York, right? Got to represent from New York. Yep. So yep. appreciate you for hopping on for today's episode. Mm -hmm. Appreciate you guys. Thank you for having me. For sure. So before we begin, you know, we got to go over it. If you're following us and you're watching us on YouTube, make sure that you are liking and subscribing to our YouTube channel. We're definitely trying to grow it out. So make sure you are subscribed. You have those notifications on. You don't want to miss out on any of our new content, whether it's new episodes, current events, anything that we put out there. You want to make sure that you guys are stay tuned. You guys are tuned in. Um, follow us on all social media on Instagram, everybodyeats.pod, on Twitter, EBE pod, and on YouTube, of course, Everybody Eats Show. So you want to make sure that you guys are tuned in to all of that. Um, on that note, got to give a shout out to our guy, John Morgan from the Live Your Purpose podcast. I don't know if you guys can really see it, but I got the Live Your Purpose uh, sweater. Um, so if you guys remember, I think it was like episode maybe like 16, 17, but we're real early on. We had John Morgan from the Live Your Purpose podcast out in Ohio. Um, so he, he, he had these, uh, these hoodies in honor or, you know, made um for his podcast so you know guys support guys support back business guys support our our guests so uh mm -hmm. shout outs to john for the live your purpose podcast um on that note that leads us to today's episode so jason ford so i like to say how how we met so a lot of guests that we've had have either been through uh like instagram dms or connections right so today mm -hmm. Um, today's connection, um, shout outs to Freddie Mullins. So back episode nine, swoosh, uh, Freddie Mullins, a uh, real good friend of mine. Um, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, we were just at work chatting it up and, uh, he mentioned, we were talking about, um, one of my favorite podcasts, EYL. He mentioned EYL, uh, did some work with the PSA Cardinals, um, which is AAU basketball team, um, up in New York, uh, I believe out of the Bronx. Um, so, uh, he mentioned that EYL did some work with the PSA Cardinals. He was like, yo, my buddy, Jason, like he's a real dope. Like I know him since man long, Like I think it'd be good to have you on the pod. Like it would be a dope guest to have on the podcast. And I was like, yo, you know, we're always looking for guests. Um, mm -hmm. so a couple of hours later, Freddie, uh, sent me the number and we set it up. So, um, networking, you know, it happens real time. That's how we grow the podcast is how we meet our guests. Um, so it happens real time. So, uh, that's how we met Jason. So from here, if you could, uh, talk about yourself, where are you from? What do you do? And who is Jason Ford? Oh, uh, well, again, thank you guys for having me uh, again. My name is Jason Ford, um, born and raised in Far Rockaway, Queens, um, to an immigrant, you know, immigrant households, uh, single mother, single parent household, families from Barbados. And we basically, you know, started there. And there's a lot of my roots are coming from living in that household, being a first generation American and just knowing the importance of grinding out and kind of earning your way through. Um, since then, I grew up, um, grew up and that's where I met Freddie in a, in a program that we were in together um, where, you know, we started we started working on we started like working to find and figure out the best schools that we can get into um and then we all went off to college and stuff like that so after college uh went to wesleyan university in middletown connecticut uh majored in math and uh pretty much went into a career of consulting afterwards so i did a lot of it consulting uh, did that for about 13, 14 years. Um, and then in the middle of my career, um, discovered my love and passion for coaching and playing and, and coaching basketball. A couple of uh, guys, a couple of guys that uh, I went to college with randomly bumped, bumped into them and just started having an idea of like, hey, would you mind helping me coach uh, this young group of, of kids that are interested in learning a game? And, you know, we want to kind of put the show on the road, so to speak, once we feel that they're ready. And uh, started doing that in about 2008 and haven't stopped since. Um, it actually has inspired me to kind of shift my careers from focusing on IT consulting and doing that work to doing uh, youth development and, you know, educational work, kind of focusing on black and brown male achievement. And what we ended up doing was taking PSA. Uh, well, at the time it was called, it was, an, it was named another, it was named something else was called Team Scan. And basically it just kind of started simple, working with a group of kids that really wanted to kind of learn the game, uh, go out there and play. But what we decided to do was essentially um, 
have them play in, you know, places that, you know, locally, but then also have them play in places that they haven't seen before just to get the experience of traveling. Right. So what we instantly started to do is like we look for tournaments that played at colleges so that instead of saying you're going to go to college and having that kind of like top down thing, figure out a way where they can have success in those spaces. And then they would naturally say, oh, OK, I can I can work here because I played in a tournament here and we won um, as or did really well or whatever the case may be. So uh, eventually we decided to just make it into a, a, a thing where we're going to use the sport to grant, to, to open doors for better academic and social opportunities and look to have ways to get these kids to, these young men to um, get to, you know, different boarding and prep schools um, through sports in, in attempts to, you know, get to the best position possible for them to get into college. Um, a lot of the kids, when we first started out, were not coming from well, you know, under-resourced and you know, um, poor neighborhoods, and it was li very limited access to you know having a quality education and quality experience. But through our own personal experiences, you know, pretty much the way that Fred and I met through the program that um, called Prep for Prep that we were all both a part of, we were able to then kind of help translate and navigate and guide these young men through. Um, so just staying with it and continuing to working and, you know, figuring out what's the best school situation for each kid. Um, we then got to the point and we kind of, you know, built a team a year after that part. We started with these kids when they were about in seventh grade. Um, and then we basically built a team a year up until we got to, you know, they were in high school and juniors and seniors in high school. Um, over the part of the time, we were able to kind of build and, and, and luckily so where we were able to, um, basically able to, you know, play at a regional level, first start locally, then, you know, play regional level and then play at a national level where we then in 2013, I believe, were uh, selected to be a part of the Nike EYBL program. Um, and then that's, that's when things kind of took off in terms of playing on a big stage and, you know, and then we kind of built the program from there. Um, so the name of the program at that point was called uh, Team Scan, but we now changed, we changed the name to Pro Scholars Athletics. We decided that, you know, we, we needed to kind of branch off on our own and, 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 you know, God bless the child has his own and kind of model that for the young men um, to say, you know, we are in full control of our destiny, so to speak. So, you know, we, we started Pro Scholars Athletics and, you know, the rest is, is what it is. We've been blessed to have every class of our kids, you know, go on from our from going on from our first first, sorry, inaugural class of 2014. Mm -hmm. Um, has gone on to uh, all have gone on to college. And, you know, we've had up to, I think, going on the numbers like 80, 81 kids from our program successfully graduate high school and um, go on to college for free um, by playing either at, uh, at the D1 or two, D1 or two level. That's amazing. And we've had all but out of that group, all but maybe two or three two or three, maybe four that have, you know, not gone on to, to, to go to access college for free. Um, you know, what, what I consider us now is not just a basketball program. I, I consider us a sports-based college prep, preparatory program where essentially like the main goal is to get to college and how to navigate this high school space, the middle and high school space to make sure that they're ready to, you know, one, get to college, but more importantly, get their degrees um, debt-free. You know, your life is very different. <laughs> life is very different when you are 23, 24 with a master's and have no debt. So instead of being in the whole six figures, you can command hopefully a six figure salary through what you've learned there if you go all the way through. So, you know, those for our, for our, for our kids, most importantly, that's the main thing, right? How do I get access to that education um, and all the networks that come along with it, right? We don't, we don't meet, right? We don't meet if we don't have those access to the networks like you were saying before. How do you get these kids access to those types of networks without having the, the associated price tag that that kills so many, many dreams and ideas and families and, and whatever um, a part of it? So, you know, to, to be able to position to position as many young men to get that debt free access um, to the education and the networks that are a part of those is, you know, is our, the name of our game. For sure. Nah, that's that's a that's a lot. Um, first, yeah. I, I want to commend you because that's that's an amazing that's an amazing yeah. program, right? Um, and the and the idea of it being solely for the um, or not solely, but I, the main goal is being able, you said, to uh, get uh, these 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 young men in, into you know college for free, essentially. And I think that's just such a um, dope goal. I took I took a sports psychology class 
and um, I learned a lot about, I guess, sports as a whole. And, you know, I, I never once heard about, you know, any programs meant to just get the kids into um, college and then, you know, along with college, you know, gobbling education or the league. But um, just right. that that's like the, the, the main the main purpose of it, rather than just, you know, you used to seeing, especially in basketball, in the basketball space, a lot of um, cash cows, you know, they're trying to just use the kids for money and stuff. So to see a program solely for the, the purpose of benefiting these kids is actually really, really. No, no, don't get me wrong. Like we definitely like to see them play as and, and use the sport as far as they get to. Like we've had, you know, some kids play professionally over the course of the years and have some, you know, some success that, you know, I can, I can look back and say, um, wow, we built a program that has had some level of success um, that kids, as you see on television, whether on college or playing the pros or internationally, um, that's all part of their individual goals as well. But we, I'm just as proud as the kids that's going on to get their masters and are now working, you know, either working and doing their own thing. So the whole point is to just get these kids in, in the space where they can be successful and not and not have the price tag that has killed off a lot, has deterred and slowed down a lot of the plans, particularly in our community. Um, you know, college may not be for everybody um, in terms, you know, or so they say. But then also, you know, there are for it's for a lot of people. It's, it's for for a lot of people as well if they know how to use it and have the access to it. So, however, a little you know, little piece of our world is getting as many of these black and brown boys access to that and can navigate through it so they can be successful businessmen, lawyers, whatever they want to be, family men, how, whatever they want to be, they are in total control. But to have that control is, you know, it does come with a price tag and we're doing our part to kind of, you know, let little, uh, you know, levy that out a little bit. It's that what, whatever means necessary mentality. Right? Whatever means necessary. And, I, and what's even more crazy is the fact that like anyone who's played collegiate sports, like I never, but like, Getting to play collegiate is not even easy, right? Like for that that goal itself, one getting to college is one thing. Then playing a sport in college, D one, D two, is a whole nother thing. And then you're saying these these guys are going for free, like that's a whole tier. You know what I'm saying? Like that's like three tiers of difficulty you have to get through. First, you have to get into the college, then you have to play, then you have to get there on scholarship. Like that's a really that is not easy at all. So. To even get to that point, I, I'm I'm interested in like like the beginnings, like when you first had this idea, like yo, I'm trying to coach, I'm trying to coach the basketball, well, right? I want to hear what what made you like in the middle of your career think, okay, this is what I want to do, like this is this is it. Yeah, I mean, could you could you explain that? <laughs> um, that's a good question. Um, for me personally, it's when you know, you know, right? Um you you go you go through life and you want to work and and you want to be successful and stuff like that and and success takes a lot of different meanings but for me part of success has always been can i help can i help others and can i you know go to bed at night go to bed at night being happy about the work that i did and my my career in consulting was great i learned a lot i was around a lot of smart people i did a lot of you know interesting work but it didn't necessarily, it wasn't as, as, as soul enriching as, as I want, as I, it, it didn't have that component to it. So coming home on the weekends and doing volunteer coaching and then realizing that this was a thing that I could do that I, that I liked. And then I would like working with the young men that we were working with and seeing them progress and then help, help guide them through that, you know, that was kind of like, oh, this is my thing. This is my passion, right? And I always knew going into coming out of college that like, I'm going to work this particular job. And until I find that thing that I really love, I'm going to learn all that I can. And then once I find that thing, at the time, I didn't know what it was. But at the time, you know, I find that thing, I'm going to take everything that I learned and apply it to that thing that I love. Right. So I did not come I did not come out of college with an idea of like, hey, I'm going to coach, you know, I'm going to build this or anything like that. It kind of happened organically. And once you kind of find that thing, you kind of just, okay, let's just be consistent. And how do I, how do I get better at it? You know, how do I coach this kid? How do I communicate with this kid so that he understands? How do I encourage this kid? Because um, there's a lot of things that are going through. How do I set the structure right? So they understand the level of expectations that we have. And, you know, I'm still competitive. So if I'm going to go out there and coach and, and work with these kids, I want to win. And, you know, teach those kids not only how to play, but learn how to win and how to communicate and, there's a lot of different things that come out of that situation 
where, you know, it's the, the, the gym is a classroom, right? The gym is my classroom. Like these are things that, you know, there's a lot of things that you're teaching in that time. And, and as time went on and also work, and then there's nothing better. And I'm sure you guys can attest to it as, you know, doing the episodes of this podcast. So there's nothing better than doing those types of things with your boys, right? People that you can rock with, that you can trust, that you can build with and kind of build that brotherhood as you kind of go through that you're willing to go with through the sacrifices and the ups and downs with. So it really just started out helping that group of kids. And then it kind of grew. And then we kind of saw opportunities and said, okay, if I get on this level, then it means more opportunities for these kids. Once I get on this level, okay, there's another one. Okay. There's another one. There's another one all for getting these kids through. Um, and things kind of grew, grew from there. Um, and then, you know, just like anything else, you just kind of stick with it and keep on growing and growing. And then the opportunities and will open up for you if you're willing to put the work in to kind of get better and, you know, hold, hold yourselves accountable, hold these kids accountable. And I have to say that we were blessed to have families and kids that bought into what we were, we were, we were the vision that we had. Um, we, it could have went a whole lot of different ways if we didn't have families that kind of bought into what we were trying to do before actually having a result or a product, right? The proof of concept didn't come out yet. So, and for us, because you're dealing with the kids so young, the proof of concept is not until they they graduate college, right? So I'm talking about, you want to go through this whole situation with me at 13, 12, 13 years old. And I'm telling you about something that's gonna happen to you at 22, yeah. right? So you have to buy in and want that same thing from that point on and be willing to go through the ups and downs of it all. Um, both grade wise, academic, you know, grade wise, socially, basketball wise, their development, and you have to be there and be willing to put that consistent love into them and pour into them. And then they'll respect you for it because you've been there consistently figuring things out with them. And, you know, and then, you know, next time you look up, you're like, oh, okay, this whole class went, or this kid's going, or I see, I remember talking to this kid on television. I see him now on playing at Syracuse or Kansas or Duke or wherever else. And, um, you know, it's been really a good joy to kind of see the progress that we've had and, and stuff like that. So hopefully that answered your question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I got, I got, I guess for me now, you said uh, first you started volunteering coaching. So the, 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 the volunteer coaching that's, that, that was before, PSA, right? Like that was a different program. And then you formed PSA, if I understand. No, no. We all started off at Team Scan. It was called, we were initially called Team Scan. Teams. Okay. We're so called- that was where you were volunteering coaching that same program. Correct. Same okay. kid. And then by the time they got to jun- juniors, we changed the name. We decided to kind of branch off on our own. Got and, it. Got you know, it. Okay. Own the program because we were, you know, we were realizing we got to an, uh, an, a tipping point. We got to a tipping point where we were getting a certain level of notoriety, but we wanted to have complete control of how we moved the kids that we were kids that we were working with and, and stuff like that. And it was just, it was just a better business decision to kind of like, you know, bet on ourselves a little bit and kind of figure it out from there. So that's, what we, so we formed our own, not, you know, at that point we had formed our own nonprofit um, and called it pro scholars athletics. Um, uh, we, we go by the Cardinals out of this homage of, you know, the school that we went to, the college that we all went to, the founding directors, um, myself, Terrence Williams, Justin Ware, and Andre Charles. We all went to Wesleyan and the mascot was the Cardinals. So that's how the PSA Cardinals came about. Understood. Um, just kind of like an homage of where we all went to school. And yeah, that's how it all kind of started from there. So we started off as Team Scan, kind of rebranded a little bit. PSA Cardinals and then you know we are where we are right now got it got it nah, that's that's crazy that's that's real dope mm-hmm. and for me like I don't know like I kind of mentioned offline like most of the people we've we've uh, spoke to kind of like have businesses um we've spoken to maybe like one or two people who have a non-profit but definitely just like coaching organizing and being responsible for entire team um that's obviously we we haven't spoken to anyone like that and I I kind of want to like I don't know if you could kind of like speak about that dynamic and how that influences you. You know, I know like for personal experience, the most I've done is like I, I've uh, I was a lifeguard for six, six years. So I would teach swimming lessons. Right. So I used to teach swimming lessons to kids who were probably from 
five to 12. Right. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, that experience definitely is amazing and like changes you a little bit when you're like teaching kids, right. Teaching, teaching kids, right. Teaches you patience, at least for me, like it teaches me patience, um, teaches me how fast, you know, kids kind of learn, um, and kind of like, you know, how you definitely have to be an example, right. Those are probably the three things. Like you definitely have to be an example for these kids. Cause you can say, you know, a bunch of things, but like, they'll definitely look to you to see how you act. Um, mm -hmm. but that's been mo mo my, the most experience I've had with like, teaching either like a you know, sport activity, whatever you want to call swimming. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, teaching these kids, coaching these, these kids from, you said from like, you know, 12, 13 to Seventh, you know, yeah, eighth grade. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, from, you know, junior high to, to high school and watch them go off. I guess like if you could speak about the influence that has taught you, maybe some lessons that you've learned um from that experience of having to you know of like coaching kids and you know like rearing them up in in sports and getting them prepared for life it's a good question um i think the two the two biggest lessons that i've learned well three it's the value of patience right like the game that we're in is a human capital game right it's how do i help prepare this kid to hopefully be successful in their in their run and, and help guide them through so it requires a lot of patience. It requires a lot of understanding and planning of saying, okay, this is what this kid looks now, but they need, they need to figure out how to do these three things, basketball wise, socially, they need to mature in a certain way. And then academically, they need to be sound. And what are the right environments to put them in so that they can get those three things done effectively and how we're going to work to kind of guide them through. And some of it requires a lot of patience to be whether or not the kid is not you know, the families may not necessarily buy in immediately and or see the and see the vision um, dealing with, you know, their own whatever else is going on. So you have to it requires a certain amount of patience at certain levels. The patience that you have in middle school is a lot. So right now, currently, I help and oversee the middle school part. So identifying the kids that are, you know, at the middle school level that hopefully can persist throughout the entire program. You know, there's it's it's amateur sports, so kids can leave, and there's no contracts that you have to be there and whatever. Hopefully, you're building a program so good, and they're developing on pace so they can stay through. But it's about identifying those kids as early as possible so that they can persist and kind of you set the stamp on the culture and expectations about what we're doing. So a lot of the things that you know when I'm I'm, I'm around the kids is about per, you know seeing them. I talk to them about or think it through like, all right, this is what they're doing now, but they need to go through these several things in order to be ready four or five years down the line to make the decision about what college they're going to go to. And a lot of that decision making, the foundations of figuring out how to be ready for that moment starts early on. So what are the things that you have to deal with to be ready for that moment, right? You may have to deal with losing Right. You know, you may have to deal with them struggling and going back and forth in their skill development, which and you have to coach them through a different way. But it, it, that stuff is purposely or intentionally being done so that they're ready for high school um, or, you know, ninth grade. They have to be prepared to do these things. And they'll, or, you know, and then in high school, it, it you know, it, it, pro it progresses to, OK, this is what we're doing now. And this is how we're modeling the experience you're going to have with us, because these are the things that are going to be respected required of you in college. So I might as well start doing bits and pieces of that college readiness now. This is what, like you said, like early on is like the, a student athlete in, at the collegiate level is like a job, right? So how do you prepare those, those kids for that type of experience? You have to deal with them in a very intentional way early. The earlier they're, the earlier they're, they're ready for it, when they get on campus, they're like, oh, okay, I, I kind of understand this. Now they got to just get used to the pace and, and the intensity of it that I can't provide, I can't mimic at the high school level or the, at, the, at the middle school level. So patience and trying to figuring that out and having that, that foresight to kind of plan and think that through, that's one. Um, two is communication, right? The way you have to communicate with these young men and show them things evolved over time. You know, when I started, I was a lot, obviously I was a lot younger. You know, I didn't have any of these grades or anything like that, but, um, it was a lot younger and I had to kind of mature myself and figure out the best way to communicate to the kids. Cause I could yell at, I could make, I could maybe yell at you, but I couldn't yell at, you know, couldn't, couldn't yell at the other kid. So what things, you know, how best are you communicating that you're still setting that expectation? Um, 
setting that expectation, um, pushing them through, knowing when you have to give them a hug to when you, you know, you have to administer some tough love and all those different types of things. And, you know, learning how to best communicate that all the way through, not only to them, but also to their families um, and, and kind of get them through that way. And then probably the third thing is learning how to love them through, right? As men, as men, we have grown, and Turkey as black men, we have grown in a particularly toxic male, you know, the male toxicity is a thing. And it definitely comes out in sports, but how do you then, you know, look at the kid and let them know that you love them. So I had to learn how to say, I love you to my other coaches. I had to show that I had to be comfortable with it in myself, you know, and the kids will make you have to do those things because like the only way you could deal with some of them is you just have to love them through and let them know that you love them and it's okay. <laughs> right. And it's, it, you know, but a lot of that work is like, you know, it was more internal to me specifically, like what I had to learn to be comfortable with, to, sh to then exhibit that love to them and know that I'm going to love you hard, no matter what you do, you know, in school, like I'm going to show up at your school. I'm not going to come announce. I'm going to show up if I don't think you're acting right. You know, I'm going to show you that you know, I'm here. I'm going to be consistent. Um, not only am I going to do that, but I'm going to let the whole school community know that this one is a PSA kid. And if you if they're having trouble, I'm invested in this kid in a particular way. Not because because I'm not getting anything. All of us, although we're a nonprofit organization, all of us are volunteers. None of us are getting paid to do this. So we're actually honestly there for the kids. But it's one thing to say it, but it's another thing to show it. And you literally have to love them through some, you know, whether let's, you know, let's stay up. Did you get your homework done? Show me your homework assignment. Um, you know, you're not doing this. Well, I, let me talk to you. You know, let's talk to the parents about how we got to, you know, get you through this or what do we need to do to work together? So it's really the having the patience, learning how to communicate better and learning, you know, for I guess you want, if you want to call it increasing your emotional intelligence so that these kids know that they're loved because the world, the world deals with them in a very specific way. If you're, you know, you know, if you're a black or brown boy in, in this, in, in, in this world. So you have to let these people, know, you have to let these boys know that they're loved, that they're wanted, they're appreciated. Um, not for, not for what their skill set is on the court, but for who they are as a person. I can look at a kid and look at them and say, you're loved, or they can go back and say, you know what, these dudes from PSA love me. And if, I have, if I'm in trouble, they'll have an issue, I can go to them and talk to them and know that these guys are gonna love me through it um, and want to make sure that I'm in the best position to, to succeed. Nah, that's a good shit, Black. <laughs> we, don't, we don't do like a segment like that. I, I just got that phrase from, from another podcast I listened to. But for real, y'all, honestly, that is uh, out of everything, you know, there probably will be said in this episode. I think that that should be somebody clip this. Um, <laughs> but now nah, I, re I really I, I, I really want to congratulate you on that. Um, the whole time you're talking, I was thinking about uh, uh, my sports sociology class and, and they, they go a lot into how coaches aren't. Uh, um, qualified. A lot of coaches aren't qualified, especially in the high school space. You know, they're just teachers at the school. Mm -hmm. they don't have any real uh, education or, or, or I guess uh, real real qualifications to coach a, a sport. So just hearing, um, I, I had a question I was going to ask, but you kind of answered it as you went, especially with the, um, the emotional intelligence and, and just relearning all that. But um, hearing the way you went about it and go about it is actually really um touches me because um whole time my last semester in college i was taking that class i got really infuriated because uh you hear a lot of coaches don't really do that they kind of just see the kids as uh, they just want to win you, you get you get a lot of favoritism and whatnot in in um in the teams and everything and just hearing you uh wanting to build that or or stressing it in in the way you conduct yourself with the with the with the kids in the program, just about uh, all the all the, um, the love you want to give them, and just letting them know that you know there's there's space. You know, I may I may be hard on you, I'm your coach, but there is a space for you to come here and and see me as another potential um, parental figure. Which is what I was going to ask. You know, especially doing you know the type of program you do, I'm sure a lot of these kids see you as as like a third parent or another uh, source of uh, emotional mm -hmm. comfort. So. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, it's all in partnership with the family. So it's not like I'm, we're not like, not this is me, but it's not like we're, we're developing relationships. At the, name, at the end of the day, this is also a relationship business, yeah. right? I, no matter what we do, we're always in communication with each other and always in relationship with each other. And my dynamic on my, the way that I relate to them will change over time. So, you know, like I said, me as a middle school director, like I'm going to be looking at them at the middle school lens in a very specific way while they're with me. Once they get into the high school, my relationship, my personal relationship with the kids in relation to like PSA and what we're doing, my relationship shifts a little bit, right? So it's more of a, I'm a, you know, a supporter. I'll, I'll still go watch kids games of, of kids at, you know, at any level, any level of our kid, you know, whether they're in middle school, or in high school or in college, I'll still go watch their games. Um, I'll still, the you know, the ones that I have relationships with like that, I'll still text them and say, hey, are you all good? You know, happy birthday. They'll text me, hey, I know my, my birthday was recently. I had texts from like four or five of the kids saying, hey, happy birthday, how are you? Um, what's going on? And we'll talk about stuff and we'll chop it up. And it's just about kind of like setting that relationship that they know that, okay, as they, you know, traverse through school, and through the program, they, you know, we still have a relationship um, and, you know, we care about what they're doing and want to make sure that we're giving them opportunities to kind of expand and, and do some things. And, you know, we're starting to, we're at a level now where we can offer up opportunities to kind of give them that extra thing to that, you know, that, that'll help them, you know, progress in life and, and stuff like that um, based off of the relationships that we've gotten and whatever. But again, it goes back to the relationship of how we go, you know, they go that they know that there's somebody in the organization where the, whoever's coaching them directly at that age group that they're in or whatever relationships that they have, whether it's been with me personally, another kid in a program an alum, or however the case may be that there's somebody in this brotherhood that that's going through and experiencing the life the same way, um, in a way that they can you know, have somebody to kind of go to. But, you know, like I said, like to your point earlier, you know, about coaching, right? Like depending on where you're going, like there's no certification, there's certifications to make sure that I understand like the health, but there's no like coaching school. There's nothing that says I'm certified to do things. So that means I, like, I got to take the ownership on our own to kind of study it and be competitive with myself about how do I get better at providing this opportunity for these kids. On top of the recruiting and all the other stuff that go into make sure you have the right kid to be able to win and be successful, but you have to pour into that kid in a certain way, but you can't pour into them without having anything to pour into them, right? So there, you know, I have to be able to, you know, steady watching games and I'm learning and I'm coaching. If I see a play, hey, I, I think that play will work for this type of kid, or this is the style, this kid's abilities are pattering after this particular player. So have that kid watch that particular kid. And you also just have to be a, a constant student of the game and kind of learning what's, what's around, what's around you in, in terms of data, in terms of film, in terms of all the different things that are out there and how to use it in a way that's going to be to the betterment of the kid um, and getting them to understand that those things are going to be used and they have them expect that. So then when the time comes for them to pick their colleges, a lot of the kids are trying to find that same environment that we provided them at the college or whatever works for them. Right. So they're going into with a mindset of like, how much film do you study? Because they, they watch film with us. What's your weight room like? Because they, they have the expectation that they got to get stronger based on like whatever their high school experiences are coupled with what we have going on and stuff like that. So, you know, there's a lot that goes into it that, you know, it's not sexy. It's not the stuff. It's not the stuff that you're going to see in mixtapes and all that kind of stuff. It's but we tell them, you know, we still preach the. you definitely preach the values of working hard and working with the families and all that kind of stuff. And then for some families, we're, we're partnering with the families, other families, we have a different relationship just because what needs to be done for that kid. Um, so sometimes we are the parental proxy for a lot of these kids. Um, and then sometimes we're just an extra person to be like, hey, Make sure you do your homework. Make sure you tell your mother that you love her. Make sure you go, you know, make sure you do your, you know, you know, you know, make your bed in the morning. All right, do those things. And because those things are the little things that kind of get you through and separate. And if you're able to do those things and know how to, you know, open up and talk to your family and, and, and advocate for yourself and those things, like those are the skills that you really need. Like I went to Wesley, like I said, I'm a math major. I haven't used a differential equation since I left. 
right? But I learned how to communicate and handle problems and all that kind of stuff. Not to say that the math stuff wasn't, it's invaluable because it definitely is. It teaches you a certain discipline about stuff, but it's really about how do you navigate, learn how to navigate those things and, you know, can you get through the problem set? You know, I'm down, you know, I'm getting the same mentality of, I got this problem set and I got to pull it all nighter in a 15 page paper is the same thing of how do you pull out a game being down 50 is the same mindset of you're down 15 with, with eight minutes left. And, you know, and you, and you got three files. How do you get through that moment? It's the same, the focus and mentality that you got to get through those the same two things. It's just exhibited and executed differently, but it's the same mentality. Nah, for sure. I definitely, I definitely like that, you know, using, using sports as a way to, um, you know, get to the deeper meaning, deeper mm-hmm. meaning um, and deeper impact. So definitely, definitely like that. Um, before, before we, we cover more, I want to, I want to wrap this up real quick so we can hit to our second segment and then we can get a little bit more detailed in that last segment. Sure. Um, so on that note, Edom, uh, he'll pull up the quote, today's quote of the day. Um, Mm -hmm. And then we will do that before we hit our third and final segment. All right. So there we go. All right. Um, Today's quote is, I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot accept. Mm. Sound like Martin Luther King. <laughs> it sounds it sounds familiar. Yeah, so uh, it's, I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot accept. This is a um, I can't say young woman, but a woman um, born in Alabama, uh, activist, black activist, African American. Um, Alabama. Born January 26, 1944, Birmingham, Alabama. Um, is, that, is that Shirley Chisholm? No, last name is... Uh, is that David? Angela Davis. Angela Davis? Angela Davis. Angela Davis. There we go. We got a picture of her on the wall. Shout yeah. out to, <laughs> to this. No, I didn't know she was born in uh in Alabama. Yeah, I didn't know that, but I was just basing it. Quick Google search real quick. <laughs> <laughs> I have no tips to give you. <laughs> Word. That's a good one. I mean, that that one of our one of our mantras is own your destiny. So pretty much it's kind of like the same thing, like do the things that you can control. Right. Take care of the things that you can control and everything else will play itself out. Right. And I think. For us at PSA and then what we you know try to go, try to govern ourselves by as well. Um, for better or for worse, is we want to be in full control of our destiny from the program level for us as men, as the leaders of the program, for us as coaches, for the ways that we go about preparing our kids to to perform and and, and ultimately win. It's control what you can control. And if you do that at a high level and and you take care of those things and it's your it's your attitude, you know, it's your attitude, it's your effort, it's being on time. Um, and is, you know, then on the court is defense and rebounding and control. And, and, and those are the things that you can control because I could have, I could get any clean shot that I want to on the court, but some days I just have an off day. And some days I can go two for, I can go two for 20 and sometimes I can go 19 for 20. Right. But though, you know, everything else is just in your control or your effort, you know, your, your effort, your energy, your level, your, you know, ability to communicate and kind of go all those, all those ways through is like, those are the things that you have to own. And if you own those things and do that at a high level, you know, a good percentage of the time you're going to win. <laughs> right. And not, not only on the court, but in life, control what you can control, mind your business and kind of own your destiny and don't let, don't let things out of your grasp, but then you will then turn around and, have to have all these conditional circumstances happen for you to get your way. Right. And like I said, for us, you know, any basketball tournament is a perfect way to kind of, you know, talk about that stuff or exhibit those things. Right. If you're in a tournament and you're playing in pool, you want to win your pool so you can advance. 
right? You don't want to be in a situation where you got to, if you win and then the other, if you, you have to win and the other team has to lose, but they got to lose by like five points or you got to win by nine. Like those are all things that are there, but those are all conditions in order for you to win versus control your destiny. If you just do the things to win the game and being positioned to win and control that, now I own everything got to go through me. <laughs> right. And not taking all the little things for granted, that will be the things that will be the tiebreaker for you not to be able to progress. Right. So that quote is definitely something that that is well, you know, that is well timed, particularly in the world today. But definitely with, with PSA, you know, you know, we definitely preach the own your destiny. <laughs> you definitely you know every time we we're out there and we celebrate a kid's act, you know, success. You know, you'll see if you watch our like our Twitter feed or you watch our Twitter feeds or our Instagram, we're always talking about owning your destiny. Um, you know, we have it on our t all majority of our t-shirts is own your destiny. So the kids are constantly being reminded that that's what you want to do. And uh, that's amazing. Yeah. No, I don't mean to cut you off. You sound like you had another point. <laughs> Okay. All right. Yeah. No, I, I was gonna say that that's real dope. Um, obviously control the controllables, right? That's one of our very uh famous mm-hmm. quotes from our boy Nigel Barker. So real similar, control what you can control, right? Um mm-hmm. and um the original quote, sorry, it was I'm not ex- uh, so I'm not gonna I'm not going to work basically because I'm not gonna worry about the things I can't control. I'm going to control the things that I can no longer accept, right? Yeah. yeah, I'm not. I'm no longer accepting the things I, I cannot can't. change. I am changing the, the things, things I cannot accept. Yeah, definitely. It goes with changing your destiny and uh, owning your destiny, and like just like making it happen. You know, what I'm saying like, um, if 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 you see if you see something going on that you really want to impact or you want to change, right? You use basketball as an analogy. I'm gonna just say this podcast, right? Like we just wanted an outlet to show and to just demonstrate we want an outlet to our audience to show that like everybody has something going on. Everybody got a business. Everybody got a professional. Mm-hmm. Everybody is some sort of professional. Everyone has a story, you know what I'm saying? And that's what we wanted. Um, and, and that's what we, we put it together, you know, um, just showing that everybody has a story. Everybody can learn from someone else. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, seeing with everything else that every other venture, everything else that we've done um, is just saying, you know, not, not to curse, but just F it. Like, I'm going to just do it. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, just having that mentality. Like, yeah. I can't stand it anymore. I'm going to just do it. Um, and, you know, you know yeah. you a lot that of, type of mentality, it takes you far. Yeah, a lot of the times it's, if you see something, do something. Like, if you see an opportunity, go for it. If you don't like something, go change it. And a lot of times we have that inner dialogue. And it's interesting. And I, I, I bring it back to the kids because, like, I'm literally seeing this, like, with the younger kids you're literally seeing the kids wanting to do something, but you see them hesitate. You see them in their head and you're like, no, go, just start. I will deal, we can deal with whatever you're doing, but what you cannot do is hesitate, Mm. right? Go take advantage of the opportunity that you see it, particularly on the court, because that would be the, that would be the, the thing that may, that may be the thing that may jumpstart another opportunity for you. But if you're constantly giving up shots, if you're constantly not communicating or hesitating or whatever, it's in those moments of hesitancy where you lose the opportunity and somebody else is going to take advantage. Mm, And that's why I love sports because those life lessons that you can't necessarily teach in school, or you have to go through a quote and dig through a quote and go find and, and whatever, like, no, like here's the pick and roll instead of, because you're afraid to get touched, you, you, you died on the screen and this happened. No, how about you fight through the screen this way? You have two choices. You go over or you're under. If you're going to communicate, this is how you communicate it now. So now we always, you know, I started talking about, um, so my so my current nine to five is I'm a school administrator at a charter school in, in East Harlem. But I started coaching and working with the kids there. And we talk about the difference of responding and reacting and how responding, reacting is just like, this happened and you just get overloaded and then you react in a certain way versus I'm going to respond because I have a certain amount of information. I have a certain amount of tools and I know what my options are. So when this situation happens, I'm going to choose to do a couple of different things. I I know the the different things that I can choose and I'm going to pick one. And then if it works great, if it doesn't, then I know to pick the other one, but that's okay. 
So it's all about being in the moment and knowing how to respond, but being, but being able to respond is so much about having the tools and knowing what your options are. No, that's powerful. Right. Right. So, yeah. So if you know how to respond to it, then you'll, then you change things up and then you can be more creative in that space and with that opportunity. But that's why I love coaching so much because you have implicitly within the game or within practices, particularly in practices, ways that you can watch to see how they're responding and reacting, teach them how to respond differently and then say, okay, and then watch them adjust. Or if they don't adjust, now I can harp on it. I can I can hold you accountable because, you know, one thing that one thing that kids respect is playing time, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. So if you don't do what you need to do or do it the way that I need it done, come sit down. Somebody and they learn that lesson really quick. If I don't if I don't perform, <laughs> somebody else is coming in to try to figure it out. Yes. And if they figure it out before I figure it out, I'm sitting on this bench and I got to wait for the, another opportunity to get back in. So. It has everybody on high, not necessarily high alert, but attentive and mindful of like, it's okay to make mistakes, but I'm not going to make the same mistake twice. Because if I make the same mistake twice, somebody can come take my spot. Yeah. Take my time. And I want to play. So you have all these wonderful opportunities and, and learning opportunities and adjustments that they can make real time. And that constant repetition of it and reps of doing it. Now they got to make the connection of translating it to all aspects of their life. And, you know, we've been able to see the kids grow in that sense because we're talking about it a lot. And so, you know, like I said, I know I went all may have gone on a little bit all over the place, but um, it's it's um, those things that, that I love what I love about coaching. And I love about the opportunities to kind of give these young men chances to kind of figure it out um, because life is very unforgiving and it could you know, they don't necessarily give them a lot of chances to, to figure it out, particularly, particularly, in, you know, in the bodies that we're in. That's a fact. Yeah, that's a that's a word. That's a bar. <laughs> I had something to say, but I mean, you you both really covered a lot of it, especially you, um, Jason. But uh, yeah, I guess to beat the dead horse, control the controllables, man. And, and, and something you touched on, I guess, don't let things um, get out of hand. You know, don't let things get out of, don't let things like pass you by so much to the point where now, um, I think you brought up that full analogy where now you have to win by um, certain certain events happening rather than it being in your own control. And uh, my final point is, my memory's failing me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Oh um, yeah, um, my final point is I guess, um, uh, what I was thinking of is people who like to complain about legislation and, and their president and stuff, but who don't vote. So, you know, if you're going to go out and complain and, and, and um, yeah, you got to write you, about everything. Yeah. You got to do your part. And, and but here's the thing. There's some people, their, their whole career is based on just sitting, sitting on the sidelines and griping, right? Their whole career is about that. And there are people that it's much easier to do that and share their opinions, but a lot of the times it's like, okay, cool. What are you doing? Right. What are you doing about it? Um, how are you going to engage in this? Cause if you're not, then why are you talking? Like you're just talking because now you want the attention versus like, all right, you know, I may be out here, but, or that kid may be out here, but that kid is out here is actually doing something fail or succeed. They're in a position to actually affect change versus you wanting to talk about it. So it's, it's, it's it's always interesting in 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 knowing and hearing the peanut gallery and what they're gonna do and the trolls and all that other kind of stuff versus all right, cool, but what do you what are you gonna do? Yeah. But I'm at least I'm out here, I'm out here in the game. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm, a, I'm I may be out here in the game and I may fail, but I'm in the game trying. Yeah. <laughs> it's a difference. It's a difference. But yeah. um on that note, uh, let's take, we're going to wrap up this second segment. So, Eden, if you could say a quote, then we'll take a quick break before we hit that third segment. All right. Welcome back. So, we are uh, going to wrap up uh, with this one last segment with Jason Ford. So, we just had some great conversation talking about, um, you know, what it takes. One, you know, great quote of the day, and then two, back on segment one, um, talking about uh, the history of PSA and, you know, the influence that has. Um, so for this segment, I'm, I'm interested in, uh, I guess, like the technicalities of running 
uh, nonprofit sports organization, right? So um, I'll, I'll save the coaching question for, for last. So I guess like as an organization as, the, as a whole, um, as a nonprofit, how is that functioning in terms of funding, right? I guess you have to, I'm sure there's equipment, you have to find a place to practice, you have to find a place to play, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, well, the games and traveling. So kind of like if you can, like, how does that work? Well, one, it doesn't work in a vacuum. Um, like I said, I've been very privileged to work with some amazing guys that you know are good at, at good at what they do in terms of logistically um, figuring out ways to make it happen. Um, both have this that have the both the skill and the will to just figure it out, right? You know, and that you know, so you know, the guy, the other coaches, and the other directors are, you know, I think we do an amazing job of kind of figuring it all, <laughs> figuring it all out. Um, it does feel at times um, when you are, you know, running a nonprofit or a business that you, there will be times that you're feeling like you're, you're building the plane while flying it. And you kind of figure it, you know, like you said, but it's a lot of like, just going to figure it out as you go along. Um, in terms of the logistics of it, it, you know, it really, this is where I was saying before, where I'm going to take what I've learned in my consulting experience and, and bringing it here. It's a lot of, you know, vision thinking, forethinking and planning and kind of having everything kind of organized in that way, which is why, you know, I credit a lot of the work that I personally have done and how I've done it. And, and by no means am I, you know, the bet, you know, you know, the, the, the expert of it and there's always room for improvement, but the planning and thinking through, okay, you know what, they got a tournament in six months let's go try to figure out the hotels now where they have vacancies and, and all that kind of stuff. And having that kind of checklist of things in terms of building schedules and finding program and like finding build, uh, practice space rather. And, and all that kind of stuff, you just kind of like tick and tie and just say, okay, how can I consistently get those things? And again, it's the relationship business, right? So how do you work with, you know, other, other places to secure building space? I mean, practice space and facilities and stuff like that when you need to. Um, so, you know, a lot of that is, you know, I, I, I go back to my, um, consulting experience and relationship management and vendor management and all those kind of things to kind of initiate those conversations and just kind of figure out, all right, here's how to do it or, you know, work in, and, you know, truly, like I said, own your destiny and figure out, okay, what are the spaces that I can control and then make sure that they're available for the kids to, to practice in. Um, so those types of things. So, but that's always, that can change and flux. Like I said, COVID has provided a lot of different, you know, wrinkles to that because certain spaces that you, when, wherever you're accustomed to being in, you can't get into, um, as much because of COVID and you just kind of figure out how to do it. Um, fundraising and stuff is always, always a challenge, not just for us, but for any nonprofit and for any nonprofit, particularly with COVID. Um, you know, I said as, as a part of, there's some funding that comes as a part of being a sneaker affiliate and getting some of those things. Like I said, we are a part of the Nike EYBL program. So there's some funding and, and resources that are, are given to us from that perspective. And then the rest is just like grassroots kind of funding, crowdsourcing, um, working with, you know, different folks to get in-kind in donations, some partnership opportunities that pop up and stuff like that you're always kind of managing that side of the business and how you can kind of expand what you have. Um, I do think, you know, as a, we, we def, just like with any organization, I think we have, you know, ways to kind of improve that and learn how to build the business differently um, and build our program out differently. I think COVID has given us a lot of opportunities to kind of try some new things out in terms of increasing the, the depth and the breadth of our programming for the kids, um, for our young men and, and kind of figuring those things out. And uh, like I said, it's, it's, but you kind of, like I said, we just kind of figure it out. It's not easy, um, particularly with the, you know, travel logistics. Uh, um, like I said, a lot of our kids go away to boarding and prep school. So we're thinking about our older kids that when, you know, sessions come along and, kids are coming from literally all parts of the East Coast. How do you get all of those kids at one time to practice? You know, how do we practice? How do we make sure our practices are good enough and intense enough to, cause we're only gonna really have them for maybe like anywhere from five to 12 hours in a, in a span of 12, in a span of two weekends. 
how do you get enough practice time in so that they do that? But then it's also, you know, our ninth grade team, our 10th grade team, our 11th grade team, the middle school, how do we do all those different things? So you kind of have to compartmentalize it to say the 10th grade has this stuff going on. The 11th grade has this stuff. The ninth grade has this stuff. Here are the opportunities and times where we can all get together and do an event together um, and kind of schedule it all off. And then, you know, if you plan it out accordingly, it's basically, it's basically like project manage program and project management one-on-one of how do you kind of parse those things through. Um, like I said, between like my program experience, my program management experiences and some of the ex- business experiences of our, you know, some of our other directors, um, you know, we kind of organize it and kind of just communicate, over communicate and just, you know, hold the co- coaches accountable to just get it done. Like, here's the plan, be there at nine you don't have time to show up at 9.05 because you need to be in there ready to practice at nine and be out by 11 because that's the amount of time that you need to work with and hold, you know, making sure that everybody has the ability to execute the plan and kind of go from there and help each other out and be available to kind of help each other out. So it's not easy. It is definitely a labor of love. Um, There are always going to be wrinkles that kind of come in the way, but you know, it's, Hey, you got to get it done. At the end of the day, you know, you know, if you if you're home with your wife or your girlfriend or whoever or your kids and the light goes off, they don't care about the story. They care about the light is off. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, you know, it doesn't matter about the story. The result is a result. So you just got to figure out a way to get it done um, and, and kind of go from there. So, you know, you're, you're, nobody's going to care about whether or not the Wi-Fi is off you know why it's off they just know that it's off and they want they want they want to get on the back online so right, just gotta so figure out a way to kind of put your head down and just get it done i like that i like that so <laughs> um to to wrap it up real quick i get my last question is as a coach right how do you develop your skills right how i guess who coaches you you know in that sense like how do you develop your skills as a coach so you can, you know, teach these kids because you have students going to the league, right? I know um, I would feed your website, Mo Bamba, Cole Anthony was part of that program. So how do you develop your skills as a coach so you can prepare these students for success and even some to be going to the league? Well, one, you're, you're, constant, you're constantly learning, right? The moment in any relationship where you feel that you're, you've learned, you've seen all that you can see and know what you all can know is the second that you're done, right? You're always learning. So as a coach, you're, you're, you're always on the look. One is a coach. You kind of have, just like in any profession, you got to put the time in to kind of work and kind of figure it out um, from everything from identifying the talent to understanding what development they need to um, figuring out based on the team that you have, what's the right system defensively and offensively that they can do and, and, and what do you want to teach them and stuff like that. You're constantly learning and drawing from different examples and resources that are out there. Um, I think, you know, for me, once I started coaching and being involved and realized that I had a passion for it, then things changed. Right. So I no longer watched NBA basketball as a fan. I watched it to learn and figure out time and possession, different things that coaches decided to do, why they decided to do it. Like literally. So now when I'm watching games, I'm not watching games just as a fan anymore. I'm watching it as a coach, trying to understand the rhyme and reason as to why people are doing things. Um, And then you'll kind of put the the 10,000 hours in and just kind of figure it out. Um, and you're going to make mistakes. You're going to make a lot of mistakes, but that's cool. You just got to learn from them and not make the same mistake twice. Um, and then as time goes on, your experiences grow, your, the scenarios that you're accustomed to grow, you understand what works for you. Um, because what may work, you know, as, as, I, as the program developed, I kind of went from being a coach to being a director. So I'm coaching the coaches. Mm. So I, it's not about me willing my eighth grade coach to do what I would do. It's about preparing him and the coaching staff to deal with all the situations and then, and then come into their own about how they want to do things. And then, you know, be there to be like, Hey, no, you know, we have a certain standard, you know, defensively, we have certain expectations. Offensively, we have certain expectations. I need to see development and growth and I can focus on that and then help the coaches develop into those spaces. Right. 
So from my program standpoint, you know, for myself and the other directors and some of the other coaches, you know, we love to have young coaches come in and want to be a part and want to learn, not for all the glory of saying, hey, I want to be on the circuit, but they legitimately want to learn how to coach. They're legitimately there for the kids. And then we can pour into those coaches because I can only coach a team of 12 at most, right? But if I have five coaches, now the program had that, that are doing it that we can kind of like develop and grow those coaches. Now I got my 12 and the other 12 that those five coaches have. And now we got 72 kids that we can now reach and, and, and positively influence in the same way. So it's all about kind of working with each other, learning from each other. Um, obviously, like you said, we've had kids that have gone on to play at, you know, high, you know, you name your level of D1 level, um, D D1 level and make it to the league. And then you get to know people and you learn from them. So a lot of the things that we do, you know, when on the road with the kids, we learn from, you know, talking to college coaches because we went on college visits and went on tours and stuff like that. And, you know, get to know college coaches and your Rolodex grows and, and, and stuff like that. And you learn certain things. So, you know, certain certain habits now we now do on the road is just a commonplace PSA thing. So one of the things that we do, because we saw it being done in certain colleges, is we take the phones. So in order to kind of eliminate distraction, the outside world, and to force them to communicate. Because, again, the most important thing in team sports is to be a, the ability to communicate. Mm -hmm. Right. So but if you don't force opportunities for them to talk to one another, they can't create that bond and that trust that will then show on the court. The best way to do that is you take their phones and you force them to talk. You have only have to worry about, I'm going to make sure you're fed, your homework is done. you 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 know, your parents know where you are or whatever the case may be, but all you got to do is concentrate on winning this game and talking to your teammates. Right. And we got that from college, from college coaches and seeing what they do. And, you know, just just anything else in terms of if you want to learn, you just learn and you surround yourself with people that 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 want to learn as well and ask questions. And, you know, and the coaching community is a great community in the sense that they want to show you because everybody likes talking about themselves. They want, you know, hey, I like that play. How do you run it? OK, let me show you. Yeah. Right? To a college coach, they love it because if I like a certain play, that typically means that I have players that suit that style. So a college coach would want to tell me how to run this system, how to run their system, because then I would find players that run their system well. Now that college coach wants to recruit my kid <laughs> because they know that that kid knows how to run what they like to run. That is bad. Right. So you're just constantly learning and trying to figure out the game. And as things evolve, how do you get a front of the ahead of the curve and certain things? So like now, a lot of the thinking that I'm having is not only with the basketball stuff, but now seeing, like you said, with the conversation that you had with Freddie in one of your early episodes is the kids now have to, can get paid for their likeness. So that means money has to come their way. Do my kids understand how to manage money now? Mm -hmm. Right? So now I got to think about that. Right? Do they understand taxes? Do they understand what FICA is? Do they understand all of that? Um, so, you know, there's a lot of growth and kind of seeing what, what the direction things are going and how do you want them to be prepared for that? So you're always learning. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Uh, that's, a, that's a lot. Definitely. Definitely. All, like, you know, even, even as, even as a teacher, you have to be doing the learning yourself. Right? It's a lot so, you don't think about. A lot, a lot you don't see on the surface. So like right. it's, it's not the pretty stuff. Sure. For sure. Only it is. It, yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff. Um, but a lot of it is just being open and being present in the moment to kind of receive it and kind of look, trying to figure out how to learn how certain things are being done. And then as a coach, how do you, again, it goes back to how do I communicate? I see this play, how do I communicate it? Um, how do I communicate it so that that kid is, is in the best position to be successful and, and stuff like that. So you're constantly learning your, and the inputs that you learn from most likely don't, the things that I've learned that I've translated to, to, to basketball hasn't always come from basketball either, right? They've come from business. They've come from watching soccer. They've come from watching football. They've come from watching lacrosse, right? They've come from other different places too. And you can kind of take that concept and apply it somewhere else. So, that, you know, as long as you're looking to kind of use whatever that's in your, 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 your exposure, you're exposed to and use it to your advantage for what you're doing, then, 
you know, good things can happen. Sure. So, man, that's a lot. That's a lot of gems. That's a lot of application. So I, I definitely really appreciate that conversation. Um, but before we leave, you know, so we don't forget. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you, you mentioned you said a lot of stuff to us um, today about um, what you do. So do you have a song? that uh you say embody that yeah, you think embodies um everything as a whole it's a song that i like or that that uh, represents your journey represents right? you know, or your like journey here that you put into to coaching psa cardinals a song that a song that i listen to and i don't i don't really talk about this much but a song that i listen to before games a lot, whether I'm whether I'm coaching or just there watching, um, is a song by um, uh, why am I blanking on the names? Uh, Most Deaf and Talib Kweli, um, called "Thieves in the Night." Right. right Bansky knows this one. <laughs> yeah, "Thieves in the Night." You know, it starts off, "Give me the fortune, keep the fame," right. Just let me get straight to that bag. You can take all the that black star. Album. Okay, okay. Yeah, black star. Is it, is black it, hold on, I I even see it. Hmm? Oh, okay, 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 okay. Yeah, it's like one of the last songs on the album. Yeah. Thieves on the night. Okay, Thieves okay. in the night. So it's you know when you listen to the lyrics, it's you know it's all about you know staying away from all the glitter and just going for what really is important and understanding who you are, who you are, and choosing you know choosing who you're gonna be. And and once you choose, you stay to stand firm. So, like I said, thinking about things in PSA and how we do things, like you're gonna make a choice. Like I'd rather you choose before life makes you makes the choice for you, yeah. right? And you know, and the standing firm on that, and letting you know that it's okay. Like you know, as long as you're doing the right thing and you're positioning yourself for success and your family for success, and you can you can lay your head down at night and be good. That's all that really matters. Um, and like I said, we've, we've had some success where kids, you know, going on and graduate that never thought they can get past high school to, you know, kids in the pros and watching them on TV, you know, it's been a blessing. And, you know, I, I definitely, you know, I hope that they, they look back on their PSA experiences and the families look back on their PSA experiences and say that we were able to kind of, you know, be a part of that journey for them in the, in the, in the, in the best way possible. For sure. For sure. So definitely, definitely appreciate that. Um, on that note, that kind of wraps up, that wraps up today's episode. Um, before we leave, how can people learn more about PSA Cardinals, the program? How can they get involved or, and, and, and any of that stuff with the, with the socials? How can they find out? Yeah, you can find us on, uh, Twitter at an Instagram under, you know, I think it's PSA Cardinals, um, is the name, or you can look, also look at our website, which is pro scholars, athletics, P R O. S C H O L A R S athletics, uh, dot com. Um, and also on, like I said, uh, and then on IG as, as PSA Cardinals as well. So on there, you, you know, you know, one of our directors, Andre Charles does a great job putting some good content on there about the way we kind of do things. And in terms of, uh, you know, what the kids experiences are and stuff like that. So hopefully, you know, reach out to us, um you know, however and you know we'll get back to you as soon as possible well for sure you guys heard it that's pro scholars athletics.com pca cardinals on their socials um but that wraps it up on today's episode jason thank you very much for hopping for on today um that was real different i was a real different you know lane that that we, that we interviewed so i learned a lot um i think really learned a lot about applying sports to life life applying to sports vice versa um and you know and the influence that you can have so i definitely learned a lot our audience i hope you guys learned a lot um i know you guys do that's, that's <laughs> what, like that's that's what the show that's why y'all here that's why you guys are here right that's what the show's about for learning um and learning from our different professionals creatives and um and all that good stuff so on that note make sure you're following us on all platforms right if you're still tuned into the end of the episode make sure that you are subscribed to our youtube channel you have those notifications on. You want to stay up to date with all episodes, current events, everything that we have 
on our social media, on our Instagram, that's everybody eats dot pod on Instagram. That's E V E pod on Twitter, our YouTube channel, is everybody eats show. We're available wherever you listen to podcasts, wherever you listen, stream, wherever podcasts are available. Everybody eats show. We are there. Uh, make sure that you guys are liking this. And most importantly, make sure you guys are sharing this. Don't be selfish. Everybody eats. We'll see you guys next week.